It's time to do another interview, and this time it's not a bike rider. It's not anyone involved in the competitive scene. It's a gentleman called Cyril Vincent, and uh, he's uh, made a documentary about a famous track cyclist, Major Tang. And that's pretty much all I know. We're going to have a chat about track cycling back in the day. We haven't met, it was a PR release that came to me last week and they said, would you like to find out more about this documentary? And I said, absolutely. But I have got my old fashioned uh, track cycling ride t-shirt on, just as a little uh, tribute to the Madison, which we all know and love. Major Taylor was a sprinter. I don't think he was an endurance rider of any shape, but um, he certainly had built a reputation at a halcyon time for track cycling in America. He came to Australia from my understanding, but I don't know much more than the fact that he did come here. Sit back and enjoy what's a long and interesting interview and you'll learn a whole lot more about Major Taylor. I like your t-shirt, that's wonderful. Oh, thank you, appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very, very cool. I just, uh, for the record, did a little uh, Madison tribute as well, but um, I know track cycling very well, but I. And I know loosely the story of Major Taylor, but I think you're going to fill me in on a hell of a lot more. So um, where do we start? I, I have got no scripted questions, but I'm pretty keen to find out about your documentary. I guess we'll start with when it's due out and um, how long it is and what you've learned while putting it all together. Yeah, so um, I'm not for the for the release day. I'm not right now going to give uh, or get anyone's hopes up. Um, but we are work for the future itself. Uh, we are working so that, you know, in the next two years, we can be able to release the, the documentary itself, but I'm not going to give a date at the moment because we do not have a specific date. It's, um, it's, um, it depending on other stuff that are going on in terms of production fundraising and securing uh, all the all the, the the material that we need for this documentary um so we still have a little bit to go uh but we are on a good way i mean i know the name major taylor and i know he's an accomplished bike rider but could you just give us a little uh overview of the inspiration for making a documentary about him please i consider myself a documentary filmmaker and I was working on a different project. It happened that I had to go to the library to get some, uh, the Worcester Public Library to get some books for that project. And I found out about a sculpture that is outside the library that talks about me. I mean, that is dedicated to Major Taylor. Um, before then, I have heard about the name Major Taylor since I lived three minutes away from uh, the Major Taylor Boulevard. But it never really appeared to me that this was an African-American bicycle rider uh, um, of the turn of the century. So when I found out about the sculpture, I was amazed uh, by what I read. And I digged a little bit more and I found out so much uh, great things and accomplishment that Major Taylor uh, um, has done. And I was really... Um, I was impressed. I was impressed by, by his story, his personal story. And when, when I went to make a little bit more research, like, you know, finding a film or a documentary, um, I did not really find anything, um, that was, you know, that was satisfying. Uh, I found a few lead, um, there was a movie, a series that was done in Australia, uh, I believe, uh, 1998, I'm not very sure about the date, but it's called Track of Glory. Um, that film is not really available no more, um, but it was more of a film, not a documentary. So as a documentary filmmaker, I was like, okay, if there's no documentary, uh, I, let me see if I can, um, I can make something. And so I started reaching out to people um, talking to people that were connected to the story, uh, the Major Taylor Association, and 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 you know black athlete that you know claim I, that are inspired by Major Taylor around the world uh, to some advisors and scholars. So I talked to a lot of people before I decided to 
to to make the documentary to say okay there is enough here uh there is a, there is a great story on a personal level but also this is uh american history and to some extent this is world history because major taylor uh was also in europe and in australia and canada and um and yeah so there was a lot uh long story short i uh we have made a num i work with a panel of advisors um which most are scholars and humanities and expert in uh, in different thematic or topic that we touch during the timeline that we are working on because again this is major teller story like i mentioned but this is american history and war history and you know through that timeline uh, at the turn of the century there was a lot going on um there was a lot going on in the country in america specifically and even in the world per se so uh here uh, as far as you know in america um we know that that was the time where um lunching uh where even you know um more um more on the scene you know there were more lynching in that period than any other period of time which contradictory was supposed to be a period of reconstruction where you know after uh, the civil war and everything um people were going to come together to uh you know black and white were going to come together uh they call it equal right uh and then somehow in 1985 um the 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 case the, the, that law was kind of reversed with the case uh I believe Plessis versus Ferguson, a big case in the United States. Did you say 1985 or 1895? 1895. Right. Around that time, you know, around that time, we, I mean, people thought they could come together. Um, they did call it the reconstruction and, and it didn't work. So I found out about that, you know, which yeah, primarily I wasn't really concerned. I was not going to the story to find out about those things. And I also find out uh, that Major Taylor was in France, was in Australia, was in Canada. And, and in all these places, he won. He won some very important prize and, and championship against, you know, uh, 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 leaders and, and, and um, champion, local champion in those countries. Um, so that was between 1901 and 1904. Um, he kind of had an, uh, a, a stop, but he came back a little later for just two years, around 1910, uh, 1908, 1910. Um, so I found a lot in this story that, you know, I could not, I could not sleep well if, if I didn't talk about those things, you know, um. This is a man that, you know, um, worked hard, did his best. Uh, when I say this is a man, it's Mr. Taylor. He did his best um, to be to be a good athlete. You know, he 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 worked hard, like I mentioned, and and he was also always fair play. And he always asks, you know, in return that, you know, people be fair play with him, give him a fair play and a square deal. Um, so again i found out a lot i'm gonna i'm gonna go now into how this story get you know to be a documentary because really for me to decide after i've talked to many people that this is a story we're going to make it a documentary it's really need to uh, resonate resonate in my heart uh, and i need to pretty much uh, i would say love the story um and 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 ready to do whatever is possible for the story to 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 work us making a doc such documentary it's like an entrepreneurial uh, venture you know it costs it costs a lot uh, it takes a lot of time energy teamwork um you know everything you can imagine from pre-development development pre-production production uh post-production promotion whatever whatever the case may be so it takes many years but i feel like we are pretty lucky to be where we are at uh with the material we have gathered the people we have put together the plan we have to now venture into fundraising and production as a filmmaker i'm not a historian per se you know like 
I become a historian because I'm working on historical uh, pieces. And so I get exposed to, again, scholars, humanities, to, to people, expert, um, and also to, to, to some materials, you know, like books and, and archival materials. Um, food. We do not have footage so far, but we have a lot of still photography. We have a lot of postcard. Uh, we have a lot of letters. Um, a lot of uh, diaries, scrapbooks, and news articles. Uh, for some people, that's enough to make a documentary. But for me, it wasn't. Uh, because on top of that, uh, we are adding reenactment. And the reason, there are many reasons to that. Uh, the first is that reenactment seems to be very effective when it comes to reach out younger generation. And, you know, um, young people tend to, uh, you know, from what we are seeing, they are they are very interested to see the reenactment part that that part that look like a movie, uh, <laughs> but you know it's still it's still a documentary and everything that is reenacted is really you know we pay attention or at least we are striving to pay attention into the minutiae the detail because it has to look accurate you know uh, we are talking about more than a hundred years ago the fashion wasn't the same. The bicycle didn't look the same. The track didn't look the same. People didn't talk the same way. It is a completely different world. Hundred <laughs> percent, and that, that's what makes it fascinating. I mean, it is a sporting story, but cultural story. You referenced lynchings and all sorts of things, which, in my mind, just you know, you, you know that it happened. That it's uh, it, it. It must have been a, a torrid time for someone trying to make a name for himself doing something like he did, but being from outside the typical cycling realm. Was he persecuted as a bike rider or did he sort of get the freedoms of a successful racer just because of his accomplishments as a sportsman? Well, um, so far we do know that um, he received a little better treatment abroad than in the United States and, and for many reasons. Um, it seems like, you know, Russia, uh, climate was a little bit more tolerant at that time in places like Europe, you know, Australia, um, cause really when he traveled to, uh, you know, France or even Australia, uh, he was a big sensation. Like people, people would gather, like, you know, I, I, um, we are working in partnership with the Indiana State Museum and they have a incredible collection that was donated by uh, Sydney Taylor Brown, the daughter of Major Taylor, uh, a long time ago. So we, we were able to have access to those material, incredible materials, by the way. And it's you, you can see pictures of Major Taylor in Australia, in Europe, in, in France, uh, in Belgium, in Germany, uh, in UK, uh, you know, and I heard he was into other places too. I have not the record of that yet. He was also in Canada. That's obvious. We have record of that. Uh, and that's where he won the 1899 World Championship, the one mile. Um, so it seems like at that time he was really respected. And by the way, another thing that makes us think that way is uh, when you look at the press articles of the time, uh, you will see that, you know, the way Major Taylor was described abroad uh, was a little different from the way he was described in the United States. You know, they use some really condescending word to, 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 to call him or to qualify him uh, in the midst of, of him winning uh, some of the best prize and competition in the country. Uh, apart from that, like in France, for example, uh, La Vie au Grand Zer, uh, which is, you know, and I, I don't think it is, is still exists. Uh, two years before Major Taylor actually show up in Europe, in France, uh, they were already having feature long article in the press talking about Major Taylor, advertising, asking if he's coming, is he coming this time or no, whatever the case may be. Because there was a huge situation early on in his career where he didn't want to race on Sunday. Uh, he promised to his mom when she passed away that uh, he was not going to race on Sunday. He kept that for a long time until by the end of his career where really he didn't have no uh, a lot 
uh, of opportunity, I would say, like he did uh, very early on in his career. But for a long time, Mizutelo refused to go to uh, foreign countries uh, to race because most races were on the weekend, be it Saturday, and mostly on Sunday. Another thing that is happening uh, 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 simultaneously with, with all that is bicycle. You know, bicycle uh, uh, at that time was, owning a bicycle was like owning the fanciest computer like now. <laughs> you know, like it was the technology of the time. It was the thing. Like people were kind of tired of horses because, you know, uh, it was expensive to, to, to keep horses in the winter time. It was harder. Uh, and sometimes the horses would pass away or all that. So it was, it was, it was a little more expensive. So when bicycle came, uh, for many people, it was like, wow, um, you know, we can move faster. We, we don't have to worry so much about half of the bicycle, uh, which is not true no more. You know, there are some bicycles that are very expensive now. And it's hard to get your head around that kind of revolution now that we're so accustomed to it, you know? Yeah. A bicycle was really the attraction of, of the time, you know, and and people would feel what they call the velodromes, um, you know, which were like track cycling, indoor track cycling. Um, if, if that's right. Am I right, <laughs> Rob? <laughs> that's right. That's right. I mean, that's where, that's why it's called the Madison. It's a, that's why the race is called the Madison because it all started at Madison Square Garden, didn't it? Yes, yes, absolutely. So, um, and, and talking about the Madison Square Garden, um, for me, one of the uh, uh, incredible events that happened there beyond the the, 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 the general races that they had there, uh, you know, what was the um, the six day race. Uh, this is this is one of uh, the most cruel race, uh, inhumane, uh, brutal, um, you know, race that I mean, I hear now about cyclocross and all those things. <laughs> <laughs> but back then the six day race was like it was a it was a, not only from a promotional standpoint it was a huge event the madison square garden will fill all those days for that for that specific event and the more time will pass the more day will pass the more the, the public will even storm the venue and people will be even outside not having access because it seems like people had more fun when Adley were already tired, uh, were hallucinating. So coming on the third day, <laughs> you probably gonna have more fun than on the first day, you know. <laughs> so it was it was just so brutal. The event will run twenty four hours, but most rider didn't really ride twenty four hours. I mean, uh, they are, they say Maka till one of the rider of the time did it for for one night so he he went over one night 24 hour but that was it so um for Mejutelo, he had his, his his strategy was race eight hour and sleep one hour uh, so and it seems like not it seems like it's so far we know that he was the one sleeping the most <laughs> and, I, because my understanding was he was a sprinter but he did the uh, six days yes he did uh, in uh, I, I believe nine, december 1890 in december 1897 yes december 1897 that season he did the six day race and he did the six day race uh because of the advices of his mentor and manager Bertie munger uh, Betty Munga was a very uh, uh, helpful person for Mr. Taylor. He took him from Indianapolis where he could not have access to uh, the YMCA, which is a, like a training center. He didn't have access to the track because he was banned for his color. Uh, so Betty Munga, who was a businessman and, you know, like uh, he used to be a successful athlete. So he was also a bicycle rider, very successful. Uh, and but he reconverted in, in in a business in business and he opened his manufacturer. He has like a bicycle manufacturing company that started in Indiana, where Major Taylor was born in Indiana Police specifically. And uh, from there, uh, Buddy Munger discovered Major Taylor. Uh, but the climate is so is so uh, uh, brutal. Is so is so complicated. Major Taylor has pretty much no real opportunity. Uh, uh, to express himself and show what he was able to, 
uh, his manager, which was, you know, a white man, advised Miller Taylor to move to Worcester, uh, where, you know, it's known that the, the racial climate was a little bit more tolerant. Uh, there was still some racism going on. Uh, he could not buy a house here in Worcester, uh, even being a champion and putting Worcester on the map. Uh, and, and, and so many other things, you know, he could not have access to some schools out here when he wanted to go back to school uh, just because of his uh, skin color. So they arrive in Worcester, uh, they settle a little bit, but Munger uh, established himself in New York as well. He established one of his store out there. He built a team because a lot of race happened in New York at that time. Uh, and, and obviously the Madison Square Garden where the bigger... <laughs> the bigger yeah. attraction so where well, you got to be there right <laughs> you got to be there uh so buddy munga is in new york um walking out having his store and he realized that you know there's this opportunity of six day race so he advised me to tell her to take part of it and this was pretty much his entry in a professional uh uh, uh you know space because this was his first professional season and and really starting with the with the six day race, uh, on a physical standpoint, it's it's cruel, you know, it's cruel, uh, and it's it doesn't make any sense to anyone. Uh, but from a strategic standpoint, the argument of Buddy Munger was, you don't have to win this. If you just participate, this is a race that has national and international attention. You, with all the controversy that is going on, if you just participate, people will talk about it. For Buddy Munga, putting Mejutelo in the six-day race very early on in his career, his first professional season was a, more of a strategic thing. And it works. It works because now this is this man that is right there in the Madison Square Garden with the top champions of the time. Uh, there are theories and ideologies going on that Black people can't do much. Uh, they can't especially achieve things on the bicycle. Um, and so, and, and many other things and many other domain in life. So this is this man out there uh, showing to the world that he can. Um, and by the way, uh, before the, 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 the main event of the six day race, Major Taylor did compete, you know, in a different category with other riders and he won. He won uh, a prize of $200. Uh, it wasn't a six day race. That was like an opening ceremony of the six day race. Um, mm -hmm. So, and he won against all those champions that were there, and obviously because he was most known for his printing qualities. Um, so uh, it, that was more easy, I, I guess, not really easy. I don't even show that as the term, but that was more, you know, attainable. Uh, so, and mm -hmm. he did achieve it. So the next day, um, this is this man with all those champions around the world that are competing. People are making fun of him. They're saying, oh, yeah, right, this man, calling him all kind of name and say, oh, he's not going to do anything. Uh, people are making fun. Some article in the press are drawn, are making some caricature, like, you know, those drawing where people exaggerate, like noses and head and things like that. <laughs> it's, 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 it's crazy. So you will see some article that describe him like that, like, uh, like somebody that is lost in the race. Uh, and that was a bad idea for Bernie Munga because... You know, this will be the end of his race ever. The six day is gonna kill him. Biases <laughs> <laughs> that form with such ease and and without any uh, consideration. They're, they're, they're just, they're just, it's strange to believe that people could be so judgmental. They're just yeah, uh, the culture is the yeah. culture. I think uh, you know when things get deep into culture or habit, it becomes very difficult to uh, chase them away, like to push them away. We are still struggling with most of those things today anyway, uh, in, on different scales. Anyway, Mr. Taylor ended up in eighth position at the Madison Square Garden, which for the world is incredible. How does this man can do it? He's the youngest amongst all the champions. We thought he would never finish. And by the way, some of the greatest champions that were known to be able to do it, some of them quit. So some of them didn't even do the sixth day. Major Taylor finished the sixth day, not in first position, but in eighth position. And again, for his manager, that was enough to make, and, and it's real, because again, you will read article like in the Worcester uh, Telegram or Daily Telegram, you know, uh, that's where he actually got his nickname of Worcester Whirlwind. 
because uh, you know people started being like, oh yeah, he's black, but he he might look dark, but he he fly like he, you know, <laughs> yeah. things when like that. Born, if he raced the six day in ninety in eighteen ninety seven, what was his year of birth? How old was he when he did the medicine? Um, I mean, his year of birth is no, uh, November twenty six, eighteen seventy eight. So he was pretty nineteen. You know, if if my if, if I'm doing the right calculations here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I see it. Yeah, because you said it was yeah. December as well. So he just turned nineteen. Yeah, very, very early on. That's his first professional season. You know, like uh, this, the, and he he end up winning of the world championship ladder. Uh, but that was that was uh, that was that put him on the national and international scene. That this is a guy you should look out to. Uh, we might think everything we are thinking about, but um, there is something in this guy. Look out to, and other people were like, no, no, you know, he was lucky enough, or you know, he needs to stand in his place. He should not even take part in the race. That's like a disappointment for you know the minor the the, the majority because they are now showing to the whole world that this dude can do it, and all the ideologies that are going on. So it was crazy and. There was also a fight between, you know, cy biggest cycling organization in in United States, the law, and the national, I believe, the national convention for cyclists. I mean, there was a fight between the northern and the south about, you know, like, okay, should black people take part in professional race and should they be even part of the clubs? And if you could not be part of the League of American Women, for example. Um, you you could not really compete on on international or on professional track because most of the professional track were owned by the League of American Women and most of the biggest races were organized by those people uh, in those organizations. So they pretty much uh, uh, there was that fight going on and everything. So it was a time really where Mr. Taylor gained attention. Later on, he kept walking, uh, and something also very important is that. Um, his manager, um, you know, this is the race where he actually met a good promoters, you know, because Buddy Munger was more of a mentor and he was a businessman with uh, some possibilities and option, but he was not really in the industry. There was this man, uh, Nicholas, uh, that was in the industry and, you know, and he, he saw what Mr. Taylor did at the Madison Square Garden and he, Pretty much, if I was going to use the term of today, he signed Major Taylor for the next season. And because he was very influent, Major Taylor now had access to some of the track that he couldn't have access before, uh, you know, and things like that. So, again, this was a very Creole race, but I feel like Buddy Munger did something good here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think that you've given a great outline to a remarkable person who, who probably did sort of uh, inspire many people. We know the story of Muhammad Ali, it's been told many times and, and, and justifiably so, but without people like Major Taylor, I wonder what would have come of many, many subsequent abs uh, athletes in all kinds of sports. Is that a fair comment? Yes, it is. There are a couple of things that I can sum Major Taylor life under, you know, and uh, the first thing is, it doesn't matter where you start, you know, it just matter where you end. And he said that many times in his autobiography, that one thing you learn about the track is that it doesn't matter where you start, it matter where you end. Um, the second thing that Mr. Taylor likes to say is life is too short for any man to keep bitterness in your heart. And it's true because a lot of the time, you know, life will happen. We're going to get hurt. Obstacle will happen. Sitting around and crying about it is not going to solve anything. So you have to pretty much let go of the bad experiences, the bad people, the bad stuff, and try to focus on the bigger picture here. And the last thing is dream big. Dream big, but because he did dream big, you know, uh, but his dream was cemented in reality and small goals and smart goals, like some people will say. Uh, and, and that means, you know, winning small races before he get onto international races and all that. I believe Major Taylor's story is really, really inspiring and is at the same level as other athletes that we know that you mentioned, Major Taylor, I mean, uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, Jackie Robinson, Jack Johnson, those big celebrity that Michael Jordan that we know, this is a man who paved the way. No black athlete has ever done what he did before. 
Um, I really appreciate Rob, you uh, taking your time to uh, to ask uh, these questions. We could talk a lot more. There's so much in this story, and which is why I decided to make a documentary because it's just the more you read, it's like you don't. The more you get to know about it, for, for me, the more I get passionate. And it seems like I don't even know a lot because, you know, like the more you read, the more you find things, the more you feel like, okay, I did, you know, I, I don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's been tremendous. I feel like I've just been educated. You know, I know, I know cycling well, but I know modern cycling well. And uh, through the modern world, we know in, in Sydney what life is like in the States. But when he started this whole career, it was everywhere he went, he would have been eyes wide open. You know, like it, it's incredible that someone would take that gamble. And uh, I'm, I'm really now looking forward to the documentary. And it's been a pleasure to, to hear a little bit about it. I wish you all the best for the next little while while you put the finishing touches to it. Can I say one last thing is um, yes. dream big, but it has to be bigger than you. Because Mr. Taylor, one of the things that really kept him on the track, even though he knew he, that could be the last race he's having is everything else that matter. His, his, his family, his, man, his mentor, everything that loves him and told him that was great. You know, with all that adversity, he could have quit and say, I'm done. I don't want to risk my life. But when he thought about that, it's not just about me, you know, that makes him wake up after being choked out on the track, thrown bucket of glasses at him. He woke up cause and keep racing cause he thought this is bigger than me. So we should dream big, uh, but so we also have to make it not just personal. We have to, you know, uh, incorporate our community, people we love or who loves us. Uh, that way, when you get a, a hard knock, a good punch, you just don't disappear. You know, you would think about all those people who matter for you, why you are doing this, and you will wake up again, whatever you are doing in life, business, sport, uh, teacher, you know, dream big and make it a little bigger than yourself. It's beautiful. That's a great message. And just when you think that you uh, have nothing left to prove, think about Major Taylor because he just kept on proving evidently. Absolutely. Thank you, Rob.